domination always has a price. The inevitable collapse of the West is a taboo subject within its borders. This is why we're going to discuss it with Dmitry Orlov, who was born and raised in the USSR, later immigrated to the US, and is now back to his country of birth which became the Russian Federation. Dmitry analyzed both giants of the former bipolar world, and the collapse of the Soviet Union has led him to write several books and articles on the notion of preparedness to collapse and how it applies to the US and more broadly the West. Well, thank you, uh, Dmitry, for uh, for being here for this episode, which will be dedicated uh, to uh, Russia collapse, the U.S. Uh, imperialism and and governance as well. So you have you have a great experience, obviously, with with Russia. You have written very interesting books on on collapse and uh, comparative a comparative book between uh, Russia and the U.S. Uh, first of all, what can you tell us about about uh, about Russia these days, and uh, how Russians uh, both perceive themselves in the world, and also uh, uh, how how they perceive the world outside? Well, it's difficult to give you a, a, a blanket answer because Russia is so gigantic and and so so diverse. Uh, but uh, you can you can focus on a few on a few different things. Uh, you can you can look at uh, Moscow, uh, which uh, basically feels like, um, on, on the one hand, the, the capital of Europe, it's, it's Europe's largest city. And on, on the other hand, it's, it's sort of like a gigantic nomadic encampment because uh, it's so full of newcomers, including uh, very large populations of of other Russian nationalities, uh, Azeris and and uh, um, and Armenians, um, huge numbers of them, uh, uh, a lot of Tatars, uh, a lot of other nationalities um, make their home in Moscow. So it's a it's a very cosmopolitan place. Um, it uh, used to have um, um, uh, this this attitude that it it really wanted to. Uh, to emulate and to to copy Europe and other places. Uh, now it's probably more eager to copy China because China is so far ahead. Um, but uh, everybody who visits Moscow uh, walks away with the feeling that you know this this is there's no reason to go to Europe anymore because this is it. It's all here. Um, there's nothing in Moscow that you can find elsewhere. Um, so it really feels like the center of the, the universe. And then outlying regions, well, they think that Russia is the whole universe. They're, it's a, the place is so vast that, that the, the rest of the world might as well not exist. Um, and it's, it's a very different mindset. Um, I would say that uh, Russians, they, they find their own country so interesting that they try. They they find it very difficult to focus on the rest of the world. Um, there are, there are very small populations in within Russia that are just completely focused on on the West on the outside, and mostly that has to do with them trying to make some money off of it. You know, it's like basically uh, picking up change that has fallen off the dinner table after the party has left. That sort of thing. Okay, and you, actually, you're anticipating on, on, on one of my next questions, but but before that, I, I have another question, which is uh, uh, how much of of uh, of the USSR's uh, heritage uh, is is still present in in uh, in today's uh, Russia? Well, there there has been a very concerted effort um, to basically bring in the entire thousand years worth of Russian history, and even to uh, reevaluate what has been for a long time rather wrongly considered the Mongol invasion. Uh, because what's happening now is that uh, Genghis, Han, Genghis Khan's uh, dream of uh, the empire of the blue sky uh, is, is coming to fruition. So basically, you have Russia, it has added uh, the Central Asian republics pretty much to to its fold already. Um, Iran is joining. 
Uh, Syria is part of it, which is a new twist. Uh, China is part of it. So it really just needs to add Korea and India, and then you have Genghis Khan's great empire back. Um, and so that's a different way to look at it. Now, if, if, you, if you consider, if you leave a, set apart the prejudice that Genghis Khan was a, a, some kind of a barbarian and, uh, and, and consider for the moment that he was a, a visionary philosopher uh, like Confucius was, um, you see that there are some, um, some similarities, some striking similarities, such as uh, Genghis Khan made it punishable by death to withhold cooperation. That's an interesting one. There are many other examples like that um, that make such a vast empire possible. Basically, if, if nobody can withhold cooperation, then you have one gigantic cooperative zone. Uh, and the empire pretty much organizes itself. Nobody really has to be you know, the top dog because everybody is trying to help for fear of being beheaded for not trying hard enough. Um, different approach, I would say. Um, so that that's uh, where you know the current Russia right now is uh, one sixth of of the planet of the planet's dry surface, and about one point six percent of the population. So it 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 gets ten time ten times the land of everybody else on average, and there's a reason for that. And that's because Genghis Khan has paved the way. When Russian Empire expanded, it was pretty much expanding into zones that were already organized in a particular fashion. That level of organization persists to this day. Okay, so what you're telling us uh, is that um, actually Russia today is expanding and not so much by force, uh, but, but, uh, but because uh, countries in the periphery of, of uh, of uh, Russia uh, want to join it, right? And maybe they want to escape the West a little bit, don't they? Well, there's nothing to escape, really. The West is pretty much folding in on itself. Uh, there isn't really the, this Western expeditionary force that's going to you know, slaughter the natives and take over their resources. That's just not happening. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, sneaky ways that it's trying to, uh, to somehow uh, maintain its dominance, uh, but, but none of them are really adding up to very much, I would say. And, and you, could, you can see, for instance, the French state um, pretty much losing it, for instance, in Central Africa after a decade of trying to keep a civil war going there. Um, the Russians came in and, and suddenly peace is erupting all over the place. And, and the French are kind of left left out of the loop, I would say. So that's, that's the pattern that the Russians come in and they, they actually go to work solving problems. And the Europeans are scratching their heads thinking, well, how can we walk away with exorbitant profits from any of this? This doesn't seem like, you know, we're going to get, this casino is not paying off um, because their attitude is basically, how do we get revenue? How do we get profits? Not how, how do we make the whole place work better? Exactly. Actually, it's very interesting uh, what you're saying about France and uh, Central Africa. And uh, I can share an experience. I, I'm originally from, from Algeria and I know, although I'm not in Algeria now, but I know uh, for a fact that uh, Russia is a player now there, but uh, it is way less toxic than, than, than France. For instance, uh, well, First, what was doing now in, 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 in Algeria and other African countries, it's, uh, it's clearly uh, neo-colonial. For, for instance, Total, the, the giant, the oil giant, the French oil giant, is, uh, is, is making very, very suspicious deals, very, suspic very suspiciously uh, 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 f f interesting for, for France, but very uh, inconvenient for Algeria. For, for instance, they are um, they are doing uh, shale, uh, shale oil and maybe shale, shale gas business in Algeria, whereas in France it's it's completely forbidden to do it there because they like too dangerous and things like that. So so uh, so yeah, uh, definitely the, the West is toxic. But that was my question really. It's, it's not it's not so much about about uh, the West the West uh, coercion, uh, but more its toxicity and uh, and more and more countries are, are trying to 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 escape that or at least to keep their people 
away maybe from uh, from the the attractiveness of the west because there is this uh, fascination fascination right uh, of the west it can fascinate it can uh, mesmerize a little bit people and drag them into this you know superficiality and things like that i don't know if 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 in russia i have this feeling but you can you can confirm or or not that uh, vladimir putin uh, and other uh, russian elites uh, they, they are probably very careful that their uh, population doesn't get too much attracted by the toxic uh, Western culture, uh, if, if I may call, call it like that. What do you think? Well, a lot of people are, are struggling with it because uh, Russia is a very open place in terms of uh, mass media. There is no censorship of any sort. It's pretty much anything goes. Uh, people are very easily seduced by the flashier aspects of Western culture. And uh, the fact that it leads to nothing and, and goes nowhere is initially lost on them. Um, there is now a, a, a recognition that uh, basically uh, uh, social media, Western social media are uh, some kind of an uh, extra, extraterritorial uh, censorship agency. So for instance, people have suddenly realized that certain things are allowed on Twitter. For instance, a propaganda of pedophilia, of sexual perversion, uh, of, of suicide, including encouraging young people to commit suicide, um, propaganda of uh, narcotics, uh, propaganda of all sorts of political violence, that's allowed. Uh, but various other things, such as uh, claiming that a, a certain election, not the Belarusian election, you know, not the Armenian election, but a certain election was stolen. Okay, that gets you banned. Um, it's 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 rather curious that you know uh, one country has decided what goes for everyone else, and so what Russia is doing now is making Twitter slow. If you try to watch a video on Twitter or listen to an audio or upload a photograph, sorry, you have to wait. And that's, the, that's just the first step. And they're, they're going to keep going with it. So there, there are going to be limits to what the West can do to Russia. Moving forward, there are going to be definite limits. Well, I would say that that's good news. Yeah, like you said earlier, the West is, is folding on itself. and. Uh... I see, I see that as, as good news and as something that was uh, unavoidable. Anyway, we'll get back to this uh, when we talk about uh, West, where the West's possible uh, collapse. Uh, but before that, what, what can you tell us about the uh, about, about who rules Russia? Who are the Russian elites today? Uh, is it still uh, the bourgeoisie, uh, the, the same one which was uh, kicked out uh, over a little bit over a century ago, which somehow came back, or is it a different one? Uh, uh, is it a different one from the, the the one in the 50s or 60s or 70s, which were was maybe um, comprised more of top civil servants? I don't know. Um, or, or is it still the oligarchy which appeared uh, during the Boris Yeltsin uh, era? What can you tell us about that? Well, it's not the oligarchy because uh, uh, the state controls something like two thirds of the economy. Uh, I think of all the mo most strategic enterprises and, and Russia is full of gigantic strategic enterprises. Uh, the state tends to have 51%. Uh, uh, um, so it determines what, what goes. Um, uh, there's been this policy of uh, whenever the West tries to crash the Russian economy and the stock market creators, uh, the government steps in and just buys it. So that, that's actually uh, the, the cheapest uh, renationalization plan you can possibly imagine. Just wait for your enemies to crash your, your stock market and then you walk in there and spend a few dollars and there it's all yours. Um, so that's been happening. As far as the oligarchs, the, the oligarchs, the thought that they, they were a political force are all either exiled or dead. Uh, the oligarchs that, that are still there are basically figureheads named on you know, the, uh, the, the holding companies that own this or that, but they don't necessarily set, set policy to any great extent. Uh, the, they're not... Uh, they're not political agents at this point. They may be economic agents, but you know, 
uh, giant bags of money the world over act pretty much the same way. They want profits, they want revenue, they want growth. So what's different about Russian oligarchs from anybody else, from any other businessman anywhere? Um, I'm not sure that there is a distinction. Um, what's happening now is a lot of it, a lot of business is being renationalized. Uh, a lot of uh, companies that were previously uh, listed uh, offshore are encouraged and given reasonable terms to, uh, to relist themselves within Russia, within Russian jurisdiction. There is also uh, a raft of projects to cancel uh, tax agreements with offshore zones so that dividends get taxed on the way out, which makes, makes sense because then there's no reason to incorporate offshore because you still get taxed. The, the offshores basically stop being tax havens. So that happened to Cyprus. That, that's probably going to happen to a lot of others. Um, the Netherlands is, is bickering and refusing to believe that this is going to be done to them, but it will happen. Um, so th that's pretty much the landscape here. In terms of who runs the place, well, you know, there's, uh, there's ma many layers. Uh, the, there's regional administrations, local administrations, uh, there's uh, lots of <clears throat> different federal structures. Um, so there's, there's no single locus of authority. Um, except for the president who basically gets his information from a lot of different sources, a lot of different committees, uh, but does have quite a bit of agency in setting the agenda. Um, he doesn't exactly issue orders, but he does define the, the overall program, uh, although he does issue quite a few orders as well. Uh, but he has incredible legitimacy within the general population that all of the 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 mid-level people don't. So when he says that something's going to happen, there's a big probability, large probability that it's actually going to happen. So what, what you're telling us is, is that actually he has an actual leadership. It's not, it's not out of fear, uh, I guess, that people follow what he's, he says. It's 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 uh, it's from he gets his legitimacy from uh, from uh, his maybe lead, leadership uh, skills, right? Well, you know, it's, uh, I don't know where the fear would come from uh, because Russia is, uh, you know, the, the state is, is not, it may be authoritative, but it's not particularly authoritarian. So uh, if you do something wrong, your business might get taken away from you. You might get shut down, but you have to do something fairly seriously wrong. Otherwise you'll get fined. So there are a lot of little fines most most things don't fall under the criminal code. They ru, ru, they fall under the civil code. So there are a lot of little little fines that that get assessed for doing this or that thing wrong. Um, in terms of getting uh, charged in a criminal case, well, you know, there's no death sentence. Um, the jails are pretty nice these days. They're better than say American jails by by a wide stretch. You get well fed. You know, and, and, and they're generally, you know, the, the, the standards to which they have to live up to uh, in terms of medical care, in terms of all sorts of other things, diet, exercise, they're all reasonable. Um, they're, they don't try to destroy people in Russian jails. Um, so people aren't really all that afraid of jail either, strangely enough. So what is it that they're going to, to frighten people with? Uh, I think it's it's more the carrot than the stick these days. What about uh, journalists and uh, freedom uh, freedom of, uh, of 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 expression and, and, and information? Uh, well, I, I, I know RT is 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 is, uh, is, is a uh, is a media mogul now. You could say an international one, which has a lot of success uh, with uh, with the common people everywhere. Uh, I guess even in the West, more and more. Uh, but what about uh, inside of, of, of Russia? How, how are things going? Because uh, the Western propaganda is always about oh, uh, Putin has probably ordered the killing of this or that journalist. Is it is it really what's happening? Is it as clear as that? Well, there are lots of journalists being being killed all over the place, and and Russia is not even on the list of those places. Um, in in Russia, uh, freedom of uh, speech is, is rather extreme. And what Russia is struggling with now, uh, perhaps not even struggling, but uh, working with, 
is that previously there have been a lot of people who are outright enemies of Russia, who want to see Russia destroyed, who get their money from abroad, working within the media space within Russia. They're basically foreign agents masquerading as journalists. They report to the US State Department. They get money through various US federal agencies. So now they, now they have to be listed as, as foreign agents or they get fined a lot of money. Uh, for a while there, there was a, a law that basically made it so that corporate entities um, uh, had to be listed as, as uh, foreign agents if they got money from abroad. Um, so the uh, workaround for that was to disband and work as individual entrepreneurs, if you will. And there was no law against that. So they plug up that loophole. Uh, but, but it's sort of like, uh, you know, that, that child's game whack-a-mole where there's a hammer and a bunch of holes that moles stick out of and you, you whack one mole and another one pops up. So that's what the Russian government is doing. But um, basically you can get away with things in Russia that in the United States will, will, would get you locked up for a very long time, um, as has happened to some people. Um, it, but but it's, it's probably too far in the direction of a free-for-all than in the direction of a, a totalitarian state with uh, uh, strict information control. Like what, what's happening in the US now is you, you can get deplatformed uh, in a split second and not even have any right to appeal or, or uh, contest. Uh, that doesn't exist in Russia. Yeah, that's good. I mean, what happened to Donald, Donald Trump uh, in the last days uh, of his presidency was just extraordinary. Um, and uh, yeah, it, uh, it's, uh, well, uh, we'll, talk, we'll get back to it, but uh, it's probably some signs of, uh, of collapse. Uh, another question which has always um, intrigued me, um, uh, during the USSR uh, era, I mean, you, you grew up, you were born and grew up in, in the USSR, uh, Dmitry, right? Yes. All right. Uh, would you say there was, there was uh, a, uh, well, the equivalent of what is white supremacy in, in, in the West? Uh, was there uh, some sort of, I don't know, is it, was it Slavic supremacy or, or so, something equivalent in, in Russia during those days in the minds of the people? I mean, not so much of the elites. Well, there's always some of that, but was, was it ever particularly significant? Uh, perhaps in some places it was, uh, but never at, at the systemic level. Um, that there was a, a, a movement, um, uh, the national Bolsheviks in the 90s that, that was uh, rather nationalist with, uh, with uh, overtones of uh, Russia for Russians sort of thing. It, it was suppressed. A lot of those people are still, still in prison for extremism. Uh, e extremism is taken extremely seriously within Russia. That is one of the things that gets you locked up for a long time. Uh, but overall, I would say that um, the emphasis is on, on Russia being this multinational, uh, where nation is actually a people multinational society uh, where peace is maintained in spite of uh, huge differences. You know, the, Russia is 25 or so percent uh, Muslim. Um, and uh, it, it, that's pretty well integrated with uh, Orthodox Christianity. So there are a lot of mixed marriages, for instance, and that's not seen as a problem. Um, as opposed to many other countries where it's seen as a huge problem. So um, I, think, I think that you know, it's, a, it's a precarious balance, but uh, overall um, the historical pattern is that uh, throughout Russia, if 75% or so of the population identifies strongly with uh, you know, the core nationality, which is Russian in terms of language and culture, then peace is maintained. But if, uh, it, if it falls under 75% and other ethnic groups uh, become more dominant, then they start to fight amongst themselves, which is what we saw all over the place in the post-Soviet space, most recently in the war between Azerbaijan and Armenia in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, the problem with uh, 
The problem with uh, Nagorno-Karabakh is that it's Russian territory. Russia bought it from Persia, outright bought it, and, and, and then handed it over to Azerbaijan. And that was a bad decision because it's none of the above. It's not Azerbaijan and it's not Armenia. It's Russian territory. So now it's being administered as a, as a sort of a Russian protectorate, which is back to the normal pattern, I would say, except that there is no Russian population there. So the situation is still unstable. Okay, um, another question that I always had in mind, uh, because you've, stu- you've, you've clearly studied the collapse, especially in Russia, very, 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 very well and very deeply. Uh, were people uh, at that time, before the collapse of the USSR, were people, uh, suspecting that it will happen. They were probably demoralized and all sorts of things, but were they, were they uh, in, in majority maybe uh, suspecting that things will, will uh, collapse and very, very brutally or, or not? I would say that the vast majority of the people had no idea that it could all collapse like that. In fact, the, the reason it collapsed like that was because of uh, several acts of treason outright treason. The people at the very top turned out to be traitors who wanted to benefit from that collapse personally um, and and benefit their friends. Um, And the rest of the people voted to preserve the USSR, but their votes in the referendum were ignored. Um, Again, by these uh, traitorous uh, power grabbing uh, nationalistic leaders. Um, so it, it was uh, it was an accident more than anything else. Well, it's very interesting because uh, it's it's exactly what, what I think uh, the the uh, the Western elites will do in the last day, just be- before the West collapse. I think they will short the system. Is this basically what what they did in Russia? Well, um, well, no, because nobody's really. T- trying to collapse the West, they're doing it all themselves. It's not like uh, China or Russia are trying to destroy Western Europe. They, they, they can just fold their arms and sit back and, and sip tea, you know? And the same thing will happen. You know, they, they don't have to lift a finger. Um, whereas there were a lot of uh, people in, in, within NATO and within, uh, specifically within Germany and, and within the United States who really wanted to see uh, the USSR destroyed, dismembered, and their natural resources and some of their population outright stolen, as in not paying for any of it. Um, and that did happen in the 90s to some extent. Uh, by miracle, uh, Gazprom, the, the natural gas company, just one of the largest companies on the planet at this point, survived and remains a state company. And then uh, through major effort, the oil. Uh, industry in Russia, which was uh, dismembered and partially stolen, uh, was renationalized to a large extent. So Rosneft is the only profitable oil company in the world right now. The rest of them are all losing money. Every single other one lost money last year, except Rosneft. Um, So uh, basically, it managed to claw, claw back some of that. But what's happening in the United States, for instance, and in the West is completely different. Basically, there used to be the state, and then below it were various corporations, corporate entities, and below that, everything else. Now, the West is organized in the following fashion. At the top is a bunch of corporations, which uh, are very much inbred in terms of who's sitting on whose board of directors. And it's all very hidden and and hush-hush and nobody really knows what's going on. And they are the ones who have absolutely bought the federal government of the United States to a point where it's now a joke. Basically, it's the corporate lobbyists that write the legislation and the people's representatives uh, pretty much sign it unread. Um, And then, uh, so it's, it's sort of a matryoshka doll. You know, it's like a doll within a doll within a doll. So outside you have this corporate cloud of of major transnational corporations. Within it, you have the US federal government. Within that, you have NATO. And within NATO, you have the EU. The EU is the shriveled little thing inside NATO to to give it some some semblance of legitimacy. So it doesn't look like some kind of an add-on to a military organization, but that's really what it is at this point. 
Um, so what does it take for, for a thing like that to collapse? Obviously, it just doesn't have any legitimacy of any sort. Um, you know, it, it, everybody in Russia laughed when Blinken, the new uh, state secretary of the United States, announced that the United States will no longer impose democracy on the world through force of arms. Everybody was just, and, and he said that what, what the United States will do now is basically spread democracy by example. And that's, a, that's when everybody did a spit take. It's like, spread what? <laughs> Where did that come from? So unexpected. But, but it's, it's really like everybody's just waiting for this thing to, to fall down on its own. Nobody really wants to even push it because then they'd get blamed for something, for breaking it, you know? It it has to it has to fall down uh, on its own. Yeah, just to, to get back to your uh, your comment comment there about uh, the EU being just a small thing inside NATO, which is a small thing inside the US. Um, uh, actually, uh, what what was quite uh, quite revealing to me is after the um, uh, Edward Snowden uh, revelations uh, in the case of France. I follow France um, more than other countries. Uh, we, we knew that the U.S. was spying, has been spying on uh, on uh, Chirac, if I remember correctly, Sarkozy for sure, and uh, Hollande, uh, Hollande who was president uh, at that time, I think, I think it was 2013, and the French reaction was absolutely zero, you know, uh, not from politicians, a little bit from the media, a little bit from the, but not, not, not too much. It should have been major diplomatic crisis, right? But nothing happened. It was like a non-event and politicians beginning with Hollande uh, uh, said, virtually said absolutely nothing about this. Don't you think it's also revealing a lot about who, who controls who and the, and the, uh, the submission of, of, the, of uh, the EU? To the, to the US. Oh, well, you know, the pattern has been set quite a long time ago after World War II. And then they sort of lost the book on how to do it. So when they added Eastern Europe, they, they sort of didn't have to know how. But but this, this all kept going in the West. So the idea is before somebody is vetted for um, top political office in, in the West, in Western Europe, they have to have some compromising evidence accumulated on them. Um, uh, best is pedophilia. You know, these days you can you can practice just about any kind of perversion. Uh, you can even do hard drugs and and then say, oh well, you know, I cleaned up, whatever. Um, but um, sexual crimes, um, well, you know, that can be disputable. So you can rape a woman, but then you know, maybe she was a disreputable woman. Who knows? Uh, but pedophilia is the gold standard of compromising evidence. So. Uh, that's that's what they try to get people on. Uh, that and tax fraud. Those are the two big sacred, inviolable things, at least in the United States. So most uh, Western politicians, before they can get into top office, uh, have to go through this uh, this this ritualistic pattern of, of transgression and and having the CIA uh, keep a file on them so that they can always be tossed out of office for some sex crime preferably pedophilia. Um, and uh, then uh, if they behave well, that is if they do everything the Americans tell them to do throughout their time in office, then after they graduate to retirement, hopefully early retirement before they get to make any big mistakes, uh, they get to give talks. They, they fly over the ocean and they deliver lectures and they get handed huge checks for those lectures, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's their retirement. That's their bonus for being such good boys. Um, so what do you expect from leaders, quote unquote leaders like that? Well, nothing. You know, Western countries are still US occupied territory. All of NATO is basically US occupied territory. The purpose of NATO is not to defend against Russia because Russia has no interest. Um, and, and the, the purpose of it is to keep all of these local politicians in line. Now, the reason I, I mentioned Eastern Europe is, is that uh, the expansion toward the East, uh, NATO expansion under Clinton, went so fast that they didn't have the time to, to accumulate compromising evidence on all of the East European leaders, which is why they're now misbehaving a lot of them. And a lot of them are, are saying things that they aren't authorized to say 
And a lot of them are signing up to things with Russia that they shouldn't be signing up for. And, and so Eastern European policy is in a bit of disarray at the moment. Nobody knows in Washington knows exactly what to do with it. And then the, the ultimate fiasco, of course, is the Ukraine, where the, the Americans thought that they had this thing under control, but they never did. Next time, we will look more closely at the US empire's preparedness for collapse. They declared just how feeble they are for all to see, how, how afraid they are, how little it takes to scare them. And then the overreaction of keeping all those troops around the capital and erecting fences, etc., shows that they're scared out of their minds. <laughs>